So now we're going to try and show this method of interlocking meter. Now you're going to have to try to remember all this. Matthew 25 is top screen here because I'm going to have to scroll so you can no longer see it say Matthew. The second window is Luke. The third is Mark. And the fourth is Revelation. And I cannot show Ephesians 1 in here right now. I'll have to come back and do Ephesians separately later. The point is that Luke is going to play on Matthew because Matthew is first chronologically the order in which these things are written and they tell you by means of these syllable counts when they write. Matthew is written first in 30 AD. Ephesians 1 and Luke are written second in 58 AD. The book of James comes out at the same time but I cannot find James specifically tying to Matthew 24 so I'm leaving him out. Mark is written about um, Passover of 69 AD, almost exactly a year before um, Titus would end up taking down the temple. And there's a reason why he picks that date, which you can tell from the way he words his meter too. He's picking it because the first time the temple went down, um, I forget if it was Ezekiel or Jeremiah, I think it was Ezekiel, had to map out that year prior by some crazy ritual he did laying on one side and versus another side okay but it was time to 365 days so it looks like that's why mark is picking this date to write right now that's a speculation because i have to go back and examine ezekiel but he's he's writing passover 69 ad he might even be writing to um like January of 69. It's just after um, Vespasian has taken over. And Vespasian took over at the very end of 196, uh, uh, rather 68 AD. Okay. And then here you've got Revelation, which was written even in this chapter. It's still 88 AD, but it looks like it's the very end of 88 AD rather than Fort Kislev which is the date when he's writing Revelation 1. Okay. And you say, well, how can you be that precise? Well, it's the way they use the meter. Okay. And we're going to have to go through what that is. Even though you've seen it probably before if you've been following this series, I want to just sort of give you a brief refresher course. So the question is, okay, these dates are doing a certain job in relation to the text. They're also doing a relationship to prior text. And that's what I want to show you. So here we are. Top is Matthew. It's first. Matthew 1 tells us he wrote it in 30 AD. You'll have to go see the Matthew 1 videos in Vimeo, which is the Matthew Meter videos in Vimeo. That's the name of the channel, Matthew Meter. And here's our first line. Okay. Right now I'm not going to talk about the text. I'm just going to talk about the numbers because I want you to see how they relate. Okay. 16. All right. That's not a date line. It's just the number of syllables. It matters, but it's for different reasons that it matters until you get to the sevening because this is a date line. Okay. The first time it sevens in any Bible text, and it might even be per chapter, which makes it really important to know that you're at the right chapter beginning because that's not always true in the Old Testament or the New Testament. You might not be at a chapter beginning. But when you're at a chapter beginning, the first time it's sevens is a dateline. It's saying, hi, I'm writing you 49 years from X. X is in the past from where the writer is talking now in time. And that past is some famous and important date that actually relates to the text being given. In other words, you're supposed to relate today when you're reading it to a particular past event that's specified by the dateline timeline. Okay, the people who got this from Matthew knew it was 30 AD already. They, they even sort of called it by that name because they had their own Anno Domini accounting. Um, but 
the importance to them wasn't high when is he writing because they know that the importance is what date in the past is tying to now because history repeats itself and that's what prophecy is one of the important roles of prophecy is to tell you that history repeats itself so that you can use today and look at today and see the parallels from the past so you know how today is going to go that's one of the roles of prophecies to show you where history is going to go because it's been there before and it keeps recycling. Okay, especially in the end times because we're in a time bubble called Daniel 926. It's like Groundhog Day. The last days are upon us. Yes, and the last days last for thousands of years. That's the whole point of this prophecy. It's not going to happen today, but it could happen today. And you just don't know. Well, you don't know if you're going to die either. So what kind of conclusion should you make? Well, if I might die today or the rapture might happen today, maybe I should learn Bible today. Duh. Okay, so that's what this is for. Okay, so 49 years is the first date line in Matthew 24. Now, I already know that it's written in 30 AD, just like the guy who got it in 30 AD would know. So then instead, I'm looking at, okay, what kind of event is he tacking back to that was 49 years prior? Well, 49 years prior was when Herod started building the second temple. Now, see why that's important? Because he's going to answer them and say, you see all this? Because they're talking about the temple. See, this is the word for temple, Yeru. He introduced the temple as the concept before he even gets to the 49. So you're already on the topic of temple. So it's very fitting that he uses 49 syllables because he could use different syllables to say the same thing. He's using 49 to remind you, well, here we're talking about temple, and now we're talking 49, and 49 years prior to 30 AD, what related to the temple? Oh. Herod was starting to rebuild the temple then. Yeah. And of course God was careful enough to preserve it through Josephus, who's otherwise often wrong on a lot of things. But he was right about that. So now we in the future, who don't know when he wrote this book because we lost this meter and therefore we don't know a lot of things. We can go back in history because we got Josephus and say, oh, well, Herod was just starting to build the temple, rebuild the second temple then. Yeah. And since the topic is temple, and you're talking about Herod rebuilding it, and it hadn't even been finished rebuilding by the time Jesus talks here, and what does he say? There's not going to be one stone left on another. Ooh. Now, what does that tell you? There's a, there's a whole doctrine in this. That you, that you find out just especially because of the 49. Okay, it makes it pointed that it's the 49 being used. What's the doctrine? Man builds and it goes for nothing. You build and build and build and build and build and you do your own works and you do your own works and at the end of it all, not one stone is left upon another. In other words, why are you spending your time on today and yourself and this world when you could use your body instead to be doing whatever it is you got to do but learn God through it that's what all those rituals in the Mosaic Law were for I don't know if you've noticed but those rituals in the Mosaic Law are like household tasks stuff you do around the house to clean yourself or clean your utensils or eat the idea was to be reminded of God in everything you do there wasn't anything magic in those motions. It was designed to remind you remind you so that when your body went through those motions, you'd be reminded of God. Yeah, because otherwise, here's what you're doing. You're living your life laterally, horizontally. Huff, 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 puff, 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 puff. Oh, I'm important. All oh, this has to be done. Blah, 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 blah. And at the end of the day, not one stone is left upon another because, honey, you're going to be underneath that stone. The only stone that you're going to leave behind you is a gravestone. So you see that 49 is real important. Here is Herod huffing and puffing to build the temple. And by the time Christ speaks in 30 AD, he wasn't done yet. He didn't get finished rebuilding it until guess what? 
about 64 AD. Some would say 66. And guess what? In 66 AD, that's when Nero ordered Vespasian to go down to Jerusalem and take out the Jews. And in 70 AD, the temple went down, which is right here, 40. See, Christ is talking in 30. So you'll notice it also ends with temple. Doesn't have to be a 70 number. It's still significant. 30, 40 years after he talks, which all Jerusalem already knew, temple is going to go down. Yes, it did. Nine years after that was also significant because the guy who took the temple down, Titus, would end up coming to the throne because his dad, who was hired to take the temple down, Vespasian, dies. And what else happens that year? Pompey the earthquake. And the Romans were really superstitious. They regarded that, that Pompey volcano earthquake as a bad sign for Titus's reign. But see, that's, you know, everything you build up, God tears down. So it's all parallel and it's all significant and it's all useful. And if you were living and you knew this meter at the time and you got to this mark, Tapocrites epen autos. Hodapocrites epen autos. That's probably better. This should be A pronunciation. Alright? Wow. What is, he ju what is the judgment now? See, it's answering, he said, but it's answer as a judgment answer as a ruler answers to give a rule yeah well the rule is that uh, Vespasian goes down because he was part in taking down the temple here in 70 AD but his physical son Titus actually did that and Titus now takes control of Rome under bad auspices and he only lasts for three years okay and then you get who do you get you get his little baby brother who is not good okay so this also marks the death of Titus yeah when when your dad see 81 is when Titus died the mission his little brother starts Okay, it's really biting that he uses blepete because when you're dead, you're not seeing anything. When you're dead, everybody's seeing you be dead. So you see, this is yet more thematic tie. What man builds gets torn down. What man builds, God tears down. You build and build, but at the end of your life, you're torn down. So why are you spending your life horizontally? Why not spend your horizontal life on God? For your own sake. See, it's very philosophical. And it's all tied to the temple, but it's also tied to the, the people ruling at the time. So it's a thematic tie that you get when you look at the meter, how it relates to the text. There's nothing magical about it. There's nothing mystical about it. It's just very clever literary style to time your syllables so that they interact with the text to give you more precise meaning of the text. So now when you read the text and it says and Jesus left and, and, and as Jesus was exiting the temple his disciples came up to him and said oh look at the buildings and then answering them with a judgment he says you see all this Truly, I tell you, there's not going to be one stone left on another. And each time he, these phrases are used, it has a doctrinal significance and the meter significance that ties to the doctrine. Now, I'm not going to go through all that because I've kind of already covered this before in earlier videos on Matthew. All right. This is the Ketos War at 84. This here is the second dateline because the second time at sevens is also a dateline. And he said, Christ is talking 63 years before the millennium starts. The millennium, if Christ had been accepted by Israel, was supposed to start in what we would call 94 AD. And so the date line with respect to the past, years from, and then years to. And that's a very common way the date lines are used 
in Scripture. Okay, especially the New Testament. Alright, the Old Testament sometimes they're only using years from. Okay, not years to. But they do have some years to usage. Okay. So here's your two sevenings. Alright, so now you would expect if, if what I told you is true, this being Matthew again, I'm going to take away the title. I'm just going to move up here. Then Luke ought to have that same style, right? Yep. But Luke is not writing in 30 A.D. He's writing in 58 A.D. So how does he tell you that? And yet talk to the same text and have it still set in 30 A.D. Well, here you go. See the 63 here? This is so cute the way they did this. The 63 tells you that Christ is talking in 30 A.D. Because 63 years from when, at the end of the 63rd year after he talks, is when 94 A.D. would start, and that's when the millennium was supposed to occur. So what does Luke do? Right here. He uses the same 63. Okay? Which also grounds it, because he's talking the same text in different word order, as Christ is in Matthew 24. And of course a lot of people say, well, why is there a second, you know, telling, and why isn't it in the same word order? Well, it has to do with the focus of Luke, which we're going to get into. But you'll notice, see, 63, 63. Luke also uses this in Luke 1 to tell you when he's writing. He's writing 63 years after the announcement that Elizabeth's going to have a kid, which was 5 B.C. Okay, so he's writing in 58 A.D. It's a no-brainer. And 58 A.D. is also 28 years after Christ died. Ding, 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 ding. See how all this beautifully fits together? And yet, he's talking of the same words, differently packaged, so that he can hit these syllable counts. Okay, well then, is he talking about the same timeline? Because... Bray, you're saying this is 49 years from. What about 49 years to? Because you said this is 63 years to. This means that this is 84 years later. And yes, that's when the Quito War starts. What about is Luke doing the same thing? And of course the answer is yes. And we'll find out more about that in the next increment.